And our final Nessie presenter today is joining us from the University of Connecticut. Connecticut. Uh, Mengang Zhou uh, was mentored by Scott Bachman and Matthew Long this summer. And the, the work that he is presenting is called Toward a Calculation of Mixed Layer Residence Time for Inferring Ocean CO2 Removal. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Min Yang Zhou. I'm a Nessie intern for the summer. My mentors are Scott Buckman and uh, Matthew Lan. Today I'm gonna to talk about toward a calculation of mixed layer resin time for inferring ocean CO2 removal. So we're facing rising CO2 with the detrimental effects of global warming. Um, this is just showing this famous killing curve that shows this persistent uh, steady increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So what do we do about it? Um, at 2015 Paris uh, Climate Change Conference, along with CO2 emission reduction, negative emissions, also known as um, CO2 removal, is considered necessary to restrict warming to less than two degrees. So there's growing interest in exploring carbon dioxide removal approaches uh, to move forward with this climate crisis. One of the most promising methods is called ocean alkalinity enhancement. Uh, by definition, alkalinity is um, the buffering capacity of the water body. So in the ocean, it means the chemical capacity of, of seawater to store CO2. So the idea is if we add um, alkaline minerals, such as quicklime, to the seawater, and the minerals gonna dissolve in the, in the water, and they're gonna increase the alkalinity um, in the seawater, hence the capacity to absorb CO2. So it will help to reduce atmospheric CO2 and mitigate ocean acidification. And a key control on the efficiency of this ocean alkalinity, alkalinity enhancement is the resonance time of surface water where gas exchange can occur. So the general concept is that to make this method if, uh, efficient or effective, you need to um, give it a sufficient opportunity for the surface water to interact with the air. So you wanna put the minerals where they could stay longer in the surface, otherwise they're gonna subduct to depth and lose the potential to absorb CO2. So our objective is to estimate mixed air resin time to infer potential alkalinity release locations. The tool we use is called Ocean Parcels. It's a really nice Lagrangian simulator in Python that allows to do customizable particle tracking simulations using output from ocean circulation models. Um, the flexibility of parcels um, will allow you to do a, a wide range of applications and, and uh, to really build very complex simulations. But here I'm gonna talk about the general structure of Ocean Parcels. It is built up from four different components. The first is a called field set. This is the where you load and set up the field. This is the velocity, uh, usually is the velocity that you use to, to evaporate particles. And then you have kernels. That's where you can define, compile kernels that will perform a specific operation on particles um, every time step. The third one is a particle set. This is where you define what types of particles you want when, where you want to release the particles, how many you want to release the part, how many particles you want to release, and you can track other variables like temperature uh, as the particle uh, move. The final is the particle file, is where you execute the simulation, um, you can write and save the output as an SED of files. So the first approach we took is to run ocean parcels forward in time. What we did is that we picked the California current system as the domain. We used the 3D velocity output from 0.1 degree modular ocean model, MOM6. We released over 13,000 dollars, 13,000 particles, uh, and let it run for 167 days. So now, now, now the question is where do the particles end up with at each time and when do they actually leave the surface mix layer? So the movie I'm showing here is the particle trajectories with time, background colors, sea surface temperature. So we are now able to track these particles, right? We have a good idea of at what time where they are. Then we develop algorithm to, we develop algorithm to, to detect when do the particles actually leave the surface layer? Um, there's two panels on the left one, I'm showing a snapshot of mixed layer depth, I just to show you how deep uh, the surface layer is uh, in the region. 
And the right hand is the map of the time the particle took to leave the surface layer. So you can see on the, the right panel, it's pretty noisy, but on the, on the uh, left lower corner, you still see filaments of this quick subduction, a dark color here, that correlates well with the shallow mixed air depth. So, it, so, so far at this stage, we're uh, we're in the stage of like more of a proof of concept. Um, ideally, we want to run a longer and a higher resolution model to show more clear dynamics. So now I show you how we can run ocean parcels forward in time to directly determine when a particle is going to leave the surface layer. And the second approach we, we took is actually run the ocean parcel backwards in time. So my mentors come up with a new tracer, it's called Mixlayer Age Tracer, MOM6. It mirrors the ideal age tracer. What it does is that when a particle is, uh, when the water body is in a mixed layer, it's gonna age one year per year, so they're gonna age. But when it actually subducts below the surface layer, it's gonna reset the age to zero. So now you have, so we have a tracer that actually track the age of a water body in the mixed layer. So we, we uh, run a MOM6 example global ALE. For eight years, um, we got the 2D velocity field. Uh, the model was one, uh, one degree global model. So we diagno uh, diagnosed, diagnosed this new tracer for eight years. Now we have a map of mixed area age, so now we have a good idea of where the water is actually owed. That's where we want the particle to end up to be. So now the question becomes, where do they actually come from so that they will end up in this region with long mixed layer residence time? Before that, I'm gonna show you um, a seasonal change in mixed layer age um, in a particular year. This is showing the boreal seasons. So in winter, we have this really old mixed layer age in the northern hemisphere, and then that moved to the southern hemisphere in the boreal summer. And from this, um, from this four panels, you can actually identify some patches with long or old mixed layer age. For example, in the uh, western boundary currents, like Kuroshio current here, you have very old age water uh, in winter. And while, um, on, the, on the other hand, uh, near the equator, the, the water always has very, very low mixed layer age. So now what, I, what, we ha what we did is that we picked three regions with three patches of water that has really old mixer age. That's where we want the sort of particles end up to be. So those are the three regions that we picked. First, I'm gonna show you the two regions that we have in the Indian Ocean. Um, this animation shows you the mixer age changes through time. So I pick a one month time window to, to look for the long mixer age patch in the ocean. So, and then I put a wrap box over which the mixer age is consistently long over this one month. And I, to, to better represent the average condition in this one month and this region, so I release, I continuously release 100 particles every two hours for 30 days. And after the releasement, I will run the model for 40 days, but it's backwards in time. So. Then I'm gonna show you this animation, just you can see very clearly how the white particles are gonna move back to the red box uh, because this model is running backwards in time. So we now, um, yeah. Then with this trajectory output, we can get a good idea of the probability of the or particle regions. Where do they actually come from to end up in a red box? This is where you sort of target at release locations. And I'm gonna show you another example that we did is in the Kurosho current, just to iterate the steps that we, we, we did to, um, for this backwards in time ocean parcel. First step is we identify surface patches with long resin time, long surface mixed layer resin time. And then we release particles for step two, we release particles and track it backwards in time from these locations. And the third step is we could get a histogram or get a good idea of where did they actually come from to end up in the red box. Just to sum up, so we have established a good uh, workflow to do a gradient particle tracking visualization data analysis. And so we first, we use forward ocean parcels to directly determine the resin time of surface mixed layer. Then we have a new H tracer, Imam 6 that we ran for eight years. 
Then we use backwards ocean, pars ocean parcels to determine the source, source locations um, for those oat regions that we wanted the particles to end up with. So in the future, we will conduct similar exercise in higher resolution global and regional models, just to show more details, right? And the second, it will be really cool to couple budget chemistry to infer potential CO2 reduction. So that when you get a good idea of how many CO2 it will remove as the particle moves. With that, I would like to thank my mentor, Scott and Matt, for this uh, great mentorship. And uh, I'd like to thank um, Nessie Program and Jerry for this great opportunity to work here on this project. And also like to send, thank uh, CISO Help for a lot of uh, technical, uh, <laughs> for help with a lot of technical problems. <laughs> and I would like to have questions. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it up to, for questions from the audience. Yeah. So it seems like you're looking for ideal places to uh, drop off the, the, the quicklime, right? Uh, I know that quicklime is really good for killing sea urchins in, in like kelp beds. Uh, do you think that there's any kind of hazards where, where you're gonna launch this? Um, and then also, yeah, actually I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. Yeah, definitely that's a good, I think there's a lot of people trying to look at the ecosystem impact of alkalinity release location. If you change alkalinity, then it's gonna definitely influence how the organism, organism um, group their shells, for example. Um, but to a large, but so far we're still in the stage where uh, trying to explore idea, the geoengineering idea. I don't know whether, I don't think there are any real experiments going on right now, maybe there will. But that part of the uh, effect is definitely worth looking at. Okay, thank you, that, that actually works out well. And then the other question was, so you've located these ideal locations that you wanna you know, drop the quick line. Now are these locations with high concentrations of CO2? Does it matter where the concentrations of CO2 are like that you're trying to absorb? Like, would you want to drop it closer to cities? Would you want to, you know, does that does that impact your decision at all? I think that's a great question. It's just definitely, so when you want to release, you def, if you consider in practice, you have a boat and drive there, no, like go there to release. Now, um, it'll be easier to release like along coastal regions. Um, as you say, CO2, I think the concentration in the air may not be that important, but you definitely want to be where the gas exchange with water is fast so that um, you can have, yeah, a better chance to absorb CO2, yeah. Awesome presentation, Min Young, great Thank you. job. Yeah. Uh, so plastics, I guess, they're, you know, pretty inert, so they'll be just, you know, cruising along in the currents, but also some other particles that have emissions and coupling with the atmosphere. So would that require a lot of modification? Have you worked on some of this? I, that's a great point. So the tool ocean parcels were designed at the beginning for people to track plastic. Where did the plastic end up in the ocean? Um, that's actually the, create, the developer of this ocean parcel was doing that initially. Um, the, uh, to answer your question, I think it's very flexible to do the like, gradient tracking offline. You, as long as you have a velocity field for that, very easy to implement. Rather, yeah. We'll contact you, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Great presentation, Ming Young. My question for you is, you had those smaller regions identified that had like the longer life period for the mixed layer. Do you have any reason why they're occurring in those specific regions of the world and like the dynamics behind them? Yeah, the only, uh, the only thing I know or I can sense is the depth of mixed layer. Um, this is also why I show this first panel here, just to compare. If you have a really shallow surface layer, that means your particle doesn't have much room to move around. It's gonna sort of leave it very quickly. Versus, um, I actually have another one that, it, well, sorry. Uh, if you look at seasonal change in mixed layer depth, that sort of 
answer the question that when you have a really deep surface layer, it can stay there longer. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you.